Let's bow our hearts and bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your presence um, that's so effortlessly here. We don't take it for granted. We never want to become accustomed to the beautiful gift that was paid for on the cross that allows us to be in the intimacy in the most holy place with the most holy Father. So Father, we've worshiped and now we open up your word so we can even deepen our understanding with the one that we love, the one that we worship. So I pray that you would help me. Pray that you would help me to speak and to preach what you would have me to say and our hearts would be ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we, um, we get into the word, the Lord just put this scripture on my heart and I want to just take a moment and just lead us as a group in, into an encounter with Jesus. Is that okay? Yes. In um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, Jesus is speaking here. <clears throat> he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I um, came across a video recently, and it took me through the encounter that I'm going to take uh, you through, and it was um, liberating and powerful. And I, I just have a sense, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or to come down, you're going to stay in your seats. But uh, you don't have to have a uh, sharp prophetic sword to say to a group that there's probably people in here that are carrying some heavy weights that you're not designed to carry. And uh, you're striving, and uh, that's kind of weighing, weighing you down. It's not a shame thing. It's not a sin thing. <clears throat> Sometimes we just take on stuff we're not supposed to carry. And I, I think leading up to what Angela said about the way she was healed. Just, oops, well, look at that. It was... I had it before, and I don't know when it was healed, but now it's healed. So I want to just kind of walk you through something, and if you would just um, kind of go with me, if you just close your eyes. And I want you to just picture <clears throat> that there's a box on your lap. And I want you to see Jesus walking towards you as you're sitting there, standing over you, and I want you to sense the love that's in his eyes and that's just radiating from him towards you. And just take a moment to allow some things come to mind that you may have been carrying. It could be unforgiveness, it could be worry, it could be fear. It could be other things that just come to mind. And as each one comes to mind, I, I want to picture, if you want to prophetically use your hand as if you're dropping in the box, you can do that as well, or you can just do it in your mind. But just take a moment and just start putting those things in the box. Take your time. We'll take a couple of more minutes. Just picture, picture yourself putting those things that the Holy Spirit is revealing to you or you know that you shouldn't be carrying anymore. And just put those in the box. And I want you to take that box with two hands. And I want you to see Jesus with his hands out to take it from you. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he wants to take those things out of your life, off of your heart, off of your mind that seem to be weighing you down. And just see him take that box from you and walk away and you'll never see those things again. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. If that resonated with anyone, would you just give the Lord a praise offering for that? If that, yeah. Anybody that resonate with anybody? All right. Well, that was fun. Guys feel better? Well, it's good to be back. Like I said, and Amber preached Sunday night and talked about the love of the Lord. And the Wednesday I was gone prior, Luke did such an amazing job of the kingdom is like. And, and uh, man, Luke, the Lord is just accelerating your prophetic gift. Just so, so powerful. And Angela's waving her hand because she was talking about that just a while back. So, so praise God. That's, that's so awesome. I, um, I've made it a habit since about 2009 to attempt every three months to go away for a few days alone. I call it mountain time after the example of Jesus, and uh, it has been something I've been doing, well, I guess since 2009. I'm getting uh, this last year that we're five months into it, I've, I've just been making sure I've been carving it out and, and making it more of a priority, because it's, it's easy it's easy to get busy with the things of life and especially those of us that are vocationally if i can use that term uh, you get busy with the things of the ministry and your ministry can actually become a mistress and it's a, a spirit that can cause you think that your first love is jesus because of the things that you do for him and and that's not really what he's looking for do you know how simple it is? Do you know what Jesus wants from every believer? The number one thing? It's time. He just wants to do what he came back to save that was lost in the garden. He just wants to walk with us in the cool of the day. He wants to have communion with us. He wants to go fishing with you. He wants to go motorcycle riding with Steve and I and, and Rick and Mark Ups. Or whatever that thing that it is that you do he wants to be part he's a good father that just wants to be with his children so we're going to talk a little bit about mountain time um, I'll share a little bit about my experience last week and, and some of the experiences I've had over the years with the purpose to encourage you to make this a part of your life you don't have to be a pastor that's preaching behind a pulpit or on staff in a ministry to carve out time to be with him and have mountain time where where you're alone with him and you have mountain time with others as well and you do a, an advance or a treat whatever you want to call it so are you guys good yes. well last week while I was away alone in prayer I was used by the Lord in a very unique way and powerful way um, I think it was like day two or three that I was there I, I was in South Florida at a Holiday Inn Express and I had spent most of the morning just sequestered and had my little Bluetooth speaker and put on some great worship music and just that's what I did that morning wasn't banging the floor and you know contending and declaring and battling and there's times for that it was just to be in his presence and worship him and then I went down to the lobby um, for some reason and uh, when I came up I was uh, I got off on the wrong floor I was staying on the third floor I got off on the second floor and and then I looked I said oh I'm on the wrong floor and then as the elevator I was waiting for the elevator to come back this other guy comes from uh, to my right and uh, he's about 57 years old this bright orange shirt on it had the name of his construction company that that he owns and works with his son and uh, I was wearing uh, a t-shirt that said uh, Angels Barbershop Route 66. Um, uh, I, I have a, a bucket list thing. I want to someday get on my motorcycle and go down at least a portion of Route 66. So when he saw it, he, he said, I had not, I had not identified myself as a Christian. I didn't have a, that was not a Christian t-shirt. It was a barbershop on Route 66. And he said to me, uh, oh, are you into classic cars? Because if you're like Route 66, that's a classic car thing. I said, no, I'm in Harley Davidson's, and, and, and that was the, the connection. So he's telling me about his 57 uh, pickup truck that he still has and how he's been restoring it. And I said, yeah, I even rode in. My bike's in the parking lot. And we just started chatting about that. And as we were talking, this you know, kind of roughneck construction guy, all of a sudden, shockingly, uncontrollably, begins to cry. I mean, weep, 
cry. I mean, blubbering, crying. It was just, it just threw me off. I mean, it's watching beaches with your BFF cry. I mean, that's, that's what it was like. And it, it threw me off a little bit because it just was so surprising. And then he looked at me with tears coming down his face and said, I need to come back to God. <laughs> he said, I can feel God on you. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 60 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and the Gentiles, which are the unsaved, the unbelievers, shall be called to your rising. The kings, which means leaders. And I, I want to share this with you for the sake of encouraging you that everyone has this availability to be used to that level. It is not set aside for someone that is a pastor or a pulpiteer or the fivefold ministry. It is available for every believer on the planet that is willing to just make the mountain time a priority of their time in their life. Bill Johnson gives a great illustration of Jesus coming down from the mountain that meets the, the father and the son, the boy that's been demon-possessed and the demon's trying to throw him into the fire to burn him alive and to drown him in water and the disciples couldn't cast him out and, and um, Jesus cast him out with a word and the boy's healed and the disciples afterwards say, why... Uh, why couldn't we cast him out? Because they had great success prior to that when he sent out the 70. You guys tracking with me? And Jesus said, well, this kind, which means a more powerful demon, this kind doesn't come out unless there's prayer and fasting. And there's two great lessons that, that Bill gives in that. He says, number one is that we pull Jesus aside and ask, why didn't we get breakthrough? It may be prayer and fasting. It may be something else. But in this case, it was prayer and fasting. But Jesus was in prayer and fasting, and that's his point in this lesson. He said, you know, when we go to the mountain, when we do pray and fast, maybe it was a month ago, we're making deposits, if you will. And then when we face darkness, we face somebody that needs to be healed or needs to come back to Christ, we're able to take that withdrawal out right at that moment. And it was just, it was stunning. And, and as he was just still weeping, I just began to pour into his life. And then he began to confess stuff. And he said, I, I used to be on my worship, I worship team. He used to play drums. And then I, I, I did, you know, he was telling me all his R-rated and, and some X-rated sins. Um, you know, there was the presence of God was there. And the love of God was radiating off of me that it brought him to repentance. And he just started to confess. So here I am trying to have some alone time. I'm in workout shorts and the t-shirt. I got this construction guy blubbering, booger coming out of his nose. I'm just telling you, it was wild. And I started to pour into him. I didn't address the sin. I started to telling him that he's a son, that God's already forgiven him. And there's a ring and there's a robe and there's a party. And I just began to pour into his life and I just began to love him. And, and about 20 minutes later, I was holding his hand and we prayed the prodigal son's prayer and he came back home. Isn't that awesome? He lives in North Florida, but you would think he's from the, the sticks of Alabama or wherever. I mean, you can get more Southern sounding than this guy. And I saw him the next day in the parking lot when I was leaving to go take a short ride and and uh, he stopped me and he told me about, you know, again, reminded me that he was on his worship team and, and he likes country music too. And he goes, after what happened uh, yesterday, he thought of a country music song title. I was on the wrong floor at the right time when I came back to Jesus. And I thought that was just, just so much fun. Uh, I hope it goes platinum, amen? I talk about the first verse of the Lord's Prayer a lot more because I think it is the foundation of our life. The Lord wants to use you in powerful, 
unexplainable ways that don't make sense. He wants to free you of things in ways that just don't make sense. I shared Wednesday night that I got a postcard from the Bethel Leaders Network and they send these prophetic cards and sometimes, you know, there's a whole ton of stuff, a couple of paragraphs. This one just said, expect miracles. And then it had Isaiah 53, 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And this happened for that man. He was in the wilderness. He was in the desert, spiritually parched and dry. Isn't that wonderful? He wants to use the body of Christ in this way, I think, more than ever before. I think the need for supernatural encounters where we bring encounters, we, we di I didn't even try. I, I didn't say, hey, by the way, do you know Jesus? If you were to die tonight, if you went out there and got hit by a truck and would you die tonight and breathe your last would you be ready to go to heaven I, I you know I, I I did all of those things reaching out to people but you know what I've learned if I spend time in the presence of the anointed one I will be greatly anointed yeah. I'd have to cry out for more anointing I already have the anointed one inside of me. Spending time with him seems to bring him to the surface. Peter experienced this when he walked around and his shadow would just heal people and demons would come flying out of people. Things that Paul touched while he was making tents, his sweat would be brought to people and they were set free. The woman pushes through the crowd and just touches the hem of his garment and something that was supposedly incurable was cured in a moment because the power just was pulled out of him the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic so this was in january actually i gave the word for 2020 in december of 2019 and i came across it today and it's been in my bible in another place and i was flipping through i came across it and i felt it was uh apropos to talk about it for today's message and this is what the lord gave me in december of 20 19. In 2020, the body of Christ is being called and greatly empowered to bring 2020 vision to the lost. To bring 2020 vision to the lost. Causing them to clearly see the reality of the goodness of God through the demonstration of heaven's power on the earth. What has been uncommon in the realm of signs, wonders, and miracles will become common. Now, when I say common, I don't mean in a, a negative way. Just, that's just the kingdom life. The church will move from being surprised into a culture of perpetual amazement by the exploit, exploits of power and authority the Heavenly Father will manifest through His children who are willing to believe and take risk. If I was to add on to that, I would say that is willing to prioritize time on the mountain. You guys good? Yes. Okay, we're going to go to our text, Matthew chapter 14. I've taught a lot from this text. I'm not going to give uh, all of the review for the sake of time and repetitiveness, but it says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, after Jesus feeds the thousands and sends them away, it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, verse 23, he went up to the mountain. He went up on the mountain by himself. Somebody say, by himself. Yes. To the mountain by himself to pray. That word pray has several meanings. One of them is worship. Jesus was a worshiper. Say, Jesus was a worshiper. Well, that was weak. One, two, three. <laughs> Jesus was a worshiper. Maybe you just have your listening gear on now. Now when evening came... He was alone there. The Bible goes on to say that he comes out on the fourth watch and he walks on a raging sea and he's glowing in the dark. You want to glow in the dark? You spend time kneeling in the other world. And he was alone there. When evening came, so it, you do the math, he was there for 10 hours because he came out on the fourth watch, was between 3 and 6 in the morning. So today's message is just 
simply entitled Mountain Time. Can we read that again? Let's read it together, though, out loud on the count of three. One, two, three. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. I felt like I was alone on the mountain. <laughs> One, two, three. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him on the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. When I speak to young pastors and preachers and I occasionally have the opportunity and honor to mentor them, I tell them the most important thing that you can do to be a benefit to your family and to your church family is to be with, alone with the Lord and to read his word to know the author not to get a sermon. So that's point number one, mountain time alone. And I pray there's a stirring in your hearts this morning that would cause you to maybe rearrange your schedules and maybe eliminate some things for a season or permanently that and not religious guilt and shame. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about making him your first love and priority. It'll change your life. So I want to talk a little bit about my mountain time. And as I've shared, I go away for times of, of refreshing. But you can also just have hours of refreshing. Mountain time doesn't always have to be you go away, you get in a car, and you get in a hotel, or get on a motorcycle. But mountain time on a Harley is just a lot more fun for me <laughs> anyway. Amen, Steve? But also you just get alone in a room in your home, maybe in your yard. Maybe you have a place where you just get into the car. Maybe it's a park that has a, a place by the water where there's hardly any people there at a certain time during the week or a certain day and hour, and you just sit in front of the water, wherever that might be. I cannot emphasize and encourage you without any guilt or shame or prodding except to communicate my hunger for more of his presence. It'll change your life. It's hard enough sometimes to run this race without mountain time. There's still the battles. The bad news still comes. So it's days and hours. And in, nine, in 2009, I want to just share a couple of quick stories. In 2009 was my first time I really started doing this and making it a part of my life. And, and I went off to actually a, um, a Catholic monastery where there were monks. And uh, it was, they leave you alone there. It's right north of Tampa. It's called um, St. Leo's Abbey. And uh, they have uh, some housing. It's like, at the time, it was $60 a day. And that included three meals. And you're in this very humble room. And, and you spent time with the monks if you wanted to. Or you could go to their services. And they have a cathedral on the grounds. It's right where St. Leo's College is. That's, I think, 130 years old. And the presence of the Lord is there in a very powerful way. Jesus loves the Catholics. I got news for you, and he's using them, and he's going to use them even greatly. And I got oodles of stories I could tell you, but I won't. But I grew up in the Catholic Church. How many of you uh, have a Catholic Church background at all? How many of you know what the stations of the cross are? You know, the stations of the cross. If you go to a, any Catholic Church, there'll be these stations of the cross when Jesus first gets arrested, all the way up through the crucifixion, all, you know, all of that. And I hadn't done them in a while, and I was there, and I just started walking, and it explains what each, and you stand there and you meditate. And by the time I got to the last one, I was having a hard time standing up under the power and the presence of the Lord. There's something about honoring a house that I may not fully agree with, but there are some things there that are good. And rather than go in there with a critical spirit and go, no, you know, I hope they're not going to make me pray to Mary. <laughs> I'd rather say, Father, I honor your earthly mother. What a sacrifice that she made. I don't agree with praying to her, but I honor her. And that's the posture that we have. And God honors honor. Amen. And I think if we want to go to the next level as a church, we have to prioritize honoring God, honoring one another, walking in humility and submission. That's one of the great prices for revival. Well, there's a few of you that agree. I appreciate it. You'll get your gift certificates on the way out. <laughs> 
And the church was just a few years old, and I had resigned from my corporate position about a year prior, and I, I was frustrated as many times I've allowed myself to be, and I've had to repent. And don't leave me alone. Anybody been there that's been in ministry? And, and I was just not happy with the, the, the church not growing at all. And uh, in my corporate career and public speaking, I'd pack rooms with hundreds. I was a, a, a co-speaker at a conference where President Bush Sr. was the keynote speaker. Those are the kind of conferences I was speaking at. So I was used to rooms being packed. And, and I was a little frustrated and I was a little prideful and a little arrogant. And it's almost like I was like, you know, well, Lord, you've, you know, you, you've seen the show, haven't you? Like, you know, what's going on? That was my, that was my attitude. I'm just going to be transparent with you. And he spoke to me this powerful word, and he said, I've not called you to build a church, but to love a city. And as you love a city, I'll build a house. And yes. <laughs> came home, and Trisha and I got on a plane to go to the Northeast to a conference with about 1,500 people at a large church that was very kingdom-minded. And Bob Hazlett was preaching that day, and that's where we first forged our friendship. And he had Trish and I stand along with one other couple in a room of 1,500, and he said, God's not called you to build a church, but to pastor. And he just literally verbatim repeated what I had heard. Got back on the plane. It's now October, a month later. Went to the Starbucks downtown Bradenton on 1st Street by Manatee Memorial Hospital. And I was sitting there with another minister just talking about ministry. And the deputy chief of police comes in. And we had done some things with the department already as a church. And he said, oh, I can't believe I ran into you. I was just with the chief. He wanted to ask me uh, when he wanted me to call you to see if you would be willing to consider being the chaplain and the pastor of the Bradenton Police Department. And from there, I have so many stories that many of you have heard. I'll tell them in more detail in the core values class for the sake of those that have heard them several times. But, but it, we've impacted just a small church at the time, meeting in a ballroom on Sundays where we had to set up and tear down. We, we've really impacted the city. We helped raise two million pounds of food for the Manatee County Food Bank when when their cupboards were, were bare, working with the mayor going on Christian television network. A pastor and a mayor going on Christian television, coming up with an idea that was downloaded to a local small church on how we can raise millions of pounds of food, and we did. And the Joseph anointing was upon us. But I say all of that to say this, that's, that came from mountain time. So there will be things that he'll do to you, for you personally. There will be things that he'll do for you for your influence. And this is all important. How many of you are already encouraged to spend a little bit more time on the mountain than you were before you came in here? Good. The purpose of mountain time is mainly threefold. Number, this is number two, um, my mountain time. To be alone with the Heavenly Father, to be transformed, so to become more like Jesus, and to effortlessly and inherently radiate and demonstrate the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Point number three, we're moving along. Everybody say he's moving along. Number three, mountain time that kills the religious spirit. The religious spirit is one of the hardest spirits to break off of people because they think it's God. It's easier to cast, I believe, cast demons out of an unbeliever, break the spirit of lust, the spirit of greed, the spirit of rage. Those are just obvious and if they're on a Christian, they, they, they don't want them. But the spirit, the religious spirit, is that spirit that thinks you're doing God a service by nailing Jesus to a tree. So as I'm going to talk about this point, I believe this is going to be a very interactive moment for us all. And God is going to reveal some things to you that may be some sacred cows that you have to crush, grind, and get rid of. Amen? You having fun yet? <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, again, Jesus is speaking. Most assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here that will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, we go to the next chapter, and this comes to pass, what he just said. Verse 17, 1 through 8, we're going to read a few verses here. You guys good? Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, 
and led them up to a high mountain. Where did he take them? He's taking them up to mountain time, but he's bringing others with him this time. Verse 2, and as he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. That had to be an amazing thing to see. Talking about heaven on earth manifesting. I would love right now for Moses and Elijah to show up and we just hand them these other two mics and if they would allow me to have some tag team preaching, I mean, that would be fun. We'd all, including me, learn some things. Verse 4, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be in mountain time. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 5, and while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of a cloud in a deep King James English accent, I'm sure. This is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Hear him. That was pretty good. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. He never wants us to be afraid. But when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The point of this is sometimes, even in our mountain time, in doing something that is pure, being with Jesus in prayer, we can get off track and we can make things equally in love with him, even though they're part of the kingdom. I tell folks that love to worship that, or worship leaders, be careful of worshiping worship. We worship worship, well, if it's a certain style, or unless I'm doing this, I can't really worship. Well, that's not pure worship. Be still and know that I'm God with no band, no music, no sound at all. It's, and he want, the music that he wants to hear first and foremost is what's, what's pulsating in your heart. So we can take the most sacred things that are good things and we can put them before Jesus, making them our first love, and that sacred thing then becomes a religious thing. See, Paul said that Satan comes as an angel of light. He's the king of counterfeit. So he might not be able to get you to go back to do the old things that you used to do, back whatever you used to do before you know the Lord, but he can get you to backslide by taking sacred things and making them religious. So I had an encounter with God, and it was unexpected this last week, and it's something that's personal and private, but I saw an area in my life where I was allowing the spirit of being a Pharisee, self-righteousness, not the righteousness of the Holy Spirit. A religious spirit sometimes will take your personal conviction that he gave you that is appropriate, and you want to spew it on everybody else because you're now the expert upon how they should live. We do it to our spouses, our children. Now, there are some things in Scripture. You guys okay? You guys awake? There are some things in Scripture that are clear. Thou shalt not. I mean, there's ten of them that are clear in the Old Testament. And there's other things throughout Scripture that nobody does if they're a Christian. But there are, are some things that are personal conviction. You know, there's some people, they just, I knew a friend, he could not have a TV in his house. And then there's other brothers and sisters I know, they're moving in the power of God. They got a TV in every room and in their car and in their wallet and now they're what, you know, and, and, and they, that's, that's fine. Now we want to make sure that we're not, we're not watching things that are inappropriate, but my, my point is, you, you following what I'm saying? And, and I'm still learning after all these years how to detect that religious spirit. And I think as I'm speaking to you, I'm getting some revelation on one of the things that we can detect it. Does it what do you feel when, when you get that thought? Because if it's anything but peace, righteousness, and joy, it's not of the kingdom. If it's something that's burdening you, making you feel shame, or feeling like you have to shame others, that's not the kingdom of God. 
So just take another moment for another encounter and just close your eyes just right now and just allow the Holy Spirit to show you some things where you've been deceived and you've been carrying something that you thought was righteous but it's been self-righteous and he wants to set you free of that so you can go to that next level of breakthrough and worship like Dave led us in in a deeper way than ever before. I think some of you are getting it right now, and I break that over their lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you experience something, the Lord showed you something. I'm not going to call you out, don't want to know what it is, but did anybody get something? Raise your hand real high. Well, I changed my mind. Come up here and tell us. No, I'm just... <laughs> no, I won't do that to you. You guys good? Number four. Two more points. The mountain of heaven. Because we're both physical and spiritual beings, we will have a tendency to climb the wrong mountain to find direction for our lives. In the multitude of godly counsel, there is safety. Don't be in the path of mockers and sinners and so on, it tells us in both Psalms and, and Proverbs. Where, where are you getting fed? What are, who's, who are you listening to? Who is your counsel? People are like elevators. Some are going to take you up and some are going to take you down, but it's your choice which elevator you're going to get on. See, I want to be a giant killer, so I'm going to hang out with giant killers. And when I start feeling like a grasshopper, I pick up the phone and I'll call Robert Slairdon. I'll call Mark Brooks. I'll call Dave Harvey. I'll call people that I know are giant killers that'll build me up, understand, and hold my trust close to their heart this is a big deal somebody say this is a big deal so we have to constantly go to the mountain of heaven alone and it also says that Jesus took other people and when we take other people with us we want to make sure those are people that have been alone see I don't want to take people to corporate mountain time in small groups unless they're committed to doing some alone time now, I know Dave's life. The reason why Dave is such an anointed worship leader, because he's not a worship leader at, alone. He's a worshiper alone. There's a, a big difference. You can be a musician, you can be a singer, you can have giftings and talents and write songs and all of these things, but if you're not spending time alone with the heart of the Father, you are robbing those that you are leading. And aren't you glad that we have worship leaders that are worshiping at home? We have to, leaders, we have to spend time on the mountain. You guys good? So because we're both physical and spiritual beings, we have a tendency to go to the wrong mountain. So I want to review some things about, number one, dual occupancy. Everyone say dual occupancy. John chapter 1, 1 through 5. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God was with him. Well, why do you think God was with him in such a saturating way? Because he spent time on the mountain. Say amen. amen. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, somebody yell out again. Amen. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Not die and go to heaven, but see the kingdom of God when now. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the realm. The Passion Translation says, says the kingdom realm. It's not talking about when you die, but it's talking about being born again. Now, so let's take a look at a couple of things. Number one, the word again. Everyone say again. The word again in the Greek is not just do over, it actually means from above. So when Jesus said for you to see the kingdom of God, see the kingdom of heaven, enter into this realm, you have to be born of water. Everyone say water. Not talking about water baptism, he's talking about natural birth. To be born of water, natural birth. And now you have to be born of the Spirit, you have to be born from above. It sounds like there's a place above that we have access to. So we have to understand that you and I live in a fleshly tent with a spirit, a soul that will never die. So we're both physical beings and we're spiritual beings. But how we perceive ourselves 
will make a difference on our perspective from what mountain we go to to navigate our life. Did that statement make sense? So we skip down in John chapter 3 and we go to verse 13. Jesus is speaking again. And he says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. So he's talking about no one's ascended except he who has descended, that is the Son of Man that is heaven. So he's talking about right now, at that time while he's talking to Nicodemus, he's explaining this dual occupancy and he says, no one has. Well, I want to say no one has at that time in history, but then after the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the sending of His Spirit to fill you and to baptize you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, now you're others that both have a dual occupancy like Jesus. But what are you more aware of? What mountain do you go to? Amen? Do you climb the mountain or do you call 1-800-CALL-LARRY? I'm going to say Larry so the other guy doesn't call me and sue me. Okay, here we go. Matthew chapter 4, 8 and 9. The last temptation. Jesus has been in the wilderness. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. You finding a theme here? A lot of mountains going on. There's the natural mountain. There's the spiritual mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You're seeing an upside-down, demonic Lord's Prayer. That's what that is. Now, just to correct some essential theology, I've heard people say, well, he didn't own the kingdoms of this world. Well, yes, he did, because Adam and Eve, the first Adam, gave them away. But Jesus went when he was in the tomb dead he went to take back the keys and then he gives you the keys to the kingdom so everybody rattle your keys in the enemy's face con rattle your keys in the enemy's face you have those keys you have the keys say i have the keys and where you will be equipped and empowered and come to the realization on how to use them guess where that place is somebody yell out mountain time can I get a hand on your mouth? Mountain time. That's where we learn the strategies. That's where we get the downloads. That's where we get the blueprints of the things that we need to do to demonstrate, radiate effortlessly on earth as it is in heaven. So, Satan takes him up to an exceedingly high mountain. How many people know that this is a natural mountain? So he says, well, look, I'll just use this as a, I'll just come down here. Well, kind of look, look at the kingdoms of this world. See all their glory. You see, when we're getting advice on the wrong mountain, the kingdoms of this world steal our heart and we see their glory over the glory of the kingdom of God. And those kingdoms of this world seem bigger, all of those things. And there's nothing wrong with having things as long as things don't have, in, have you. But Jesus understood his dual occupancy. So while the devil can only take you so high, he can only take you so high to a certain mountain. But Jesus was on another mountain. He was seeing the kingdoms of this world from the heavenly realm. And they didn't look as big. They didn't look as glitterly. And that's why he rebuked him and said, you shall worship the Lord your God and worship him only. Amen? So where does this take place? Can you yell it out one more time? Mountain time. Number five, and in closing, mountaintop thinking. Everybody put your hand on your head and say, Lord Jesus, heal this thing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the battle is in your mind. I know this too well. That's where the attacks come. That's where the lies come. That's where the accuser of the brethren comes. That's where we can even conjure up demons that don't exist because we allow him to have a playground in our brain. That's why the reading of the word, the washing of the word, the getting in his presence, these basic 101s of Christianity are so important. I could go on and on. Colossians 3, verse 2, a very familiar scripture. Set your minds on things above, 
not on the earth. It's important for you to get comfortable at the end of your day and maybe prop up your pillow and put on worship music, put on your audio Bible, or just meditate on the good things of God. Go down the list, get a memory stone like I have and hold it and remember the things that God has done. Set your mind on, think about the heavenly things. This is mountaintop thinking. Mountaintop thinking, the heavenly mountain. Isaiah chapter 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, somebody say that. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. One of the things I learned shockingly deep in this time away with the Lord was how unusual He would sometimes have me do things to set me free. Things that didn't make sense. Things that look, would look foolish to the natural eye. Things that I would not want posted on YouTube when I'm alone worshiping with the Lord because some of you want, would want me to wear the special jacket. <laughs> I think we have to be childlike like never before. I think we have to be like David that said, I will be more undignified the next time I dance. I think we have to allow him to examine our hearts and show us whatever it takes. Dave said, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I want to be free. I want to be like him. And I want others to get off the wrong floor at the right time and come back to Jesus simply because I spent time on the mountain. It's important that you're prepared to do things that don't make sense. One example, and I'll pray. Gideon is freaking out. <laughs> the army that's coming against him, is he's so outnumbered. You know the story. And he says, well, let's get rid of a whole bunch of your people until you only have 300. That does not make sense. But there's something that's interesting in Judges. You can look at it for yourself. I'm not going to read it to you. It's in chapter 7. That Gideon is afraid. And the Lord says to him, if you're afraid, go down to the camp of your enemy. <laughs> Wait a minute. I've got to climb in the ring with Tyson Fury, if you're any boxing fans in here. I think he's like 6'6", 300 pounds. I'm afraid of him. What do I do? Well, yeah, climb in the ring. <laughs> it was a boy that took down Goliath. Because of all the time that he spent on the mountain taking care of his few sheep, and everybody else was trembling in their boots, when David was there, Saul said, well, you know, I don't want to go, so here's my armor. But when David put on earthly armor, it didn't feel right. And he would have been defeated if he would have been wearing that religious armor. So he took it off, and he remembered, wait a minute, when I was on the mountain with my few sheep playing my harp, singing to the Lord, there was a lion and a bear that tried to kill those sheep, and I devoured them with my bare hands. Yeah. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that you would speak that way about my God? And he picks up a stone. Come on. Yeah. <sighs> Bam. Nails him in the head, but he's not satisfied. So he runs down. Now he draws the sword. I think it was, was it Goliath's sword? Bible scholars was Goliath's sword. And, and takes off his head. Important point. We're talking about mountain time thinking here. Amen? The Israelites, along with their king, were all shivering in their boots. But once the head was cut off, they all came back into their right mind, and they all stormed after the army of the Philistines and wiped them out. You cannot take the head off the enemy in your life unless you have mountain time thinking. Would you stand? Amen? Oh, so good.
you bow your heads one more time? If you're watching us online, we love you. And if you've never said yes to Jesus or you want to come back to Jesus, just put that in the comments. I'm coming back home. I'm coming back home. And if there's anybody in this room, and if everyone just close your eyes and bow your heads, if there's anyone in the room that's away from the Lord or never accepted him and you want to get right with Jesus, would you just stretch up your hand? Is there anyone? I see one hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, that's okay. Keep your eyes closed. No one looking around between you and God. But I want to give you an opportunity to just make a vow to the Lord. And, and make your vow carefully. If you're not ready, don't raise your hand. No pressure. Not prompting you. I just want you to just take a moment and rest. But this is an important moment. This is an important vow that you will dedicate more time than before to go to the mountain. Just take a moment. And as you feel a peace and an ability to say yes and give him your yes like Angela taught us last week, just let your hands start to slip up and, and hold them up. Yeah. I'll just wait a little bit longer. Take your time. If you're not ready to make that commitment, don't raise your hand. It's not a contest. It's, it's something we, we want it to be real. We want it to be real. I, I've seen altar calls that have been manipulated over the years, and it, it, I hate that. I want it to be real. Let your heart come before your hand goes up. Yeah. So, Father, now let's all just lift our hands and end in worship. We bless your name. We give you glory. And even in this moment, Lord God, as a group, we climb the mountain in the Spirit. And we worship you and we love you, Father God. And when we go to the mountain time experience, may we realize that the most important thing we can do is just to worship you, to sing to you, to read your word out loud and declare it over our lives. And then your kingdom will come to our minds, our hearts, and even rest on us when there's someone that needs to come back to Jesus like my friend in the Holiday Inn. So, Father, I just pray hearts would be stirred like never before to spend time kneeling in the other world in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Can you give the Lord another praise offering before we close out? Thank you for your patience. I'm going to invite the, um, the prayer team, the leadership team to come down. And those of you that still need uh, prayer, if you uh, need to be ministered to a little bit longer, feel free to come down. They're here to pray for you. I love you guys. I love this church. Wednesday, cover dish. Till we see each other again, let's get out there and give them heaven. God bless you.